Good morning. It's good to be in the Lord's house with you today as we uh, worship our Lord and Savior as uh, spring continues to push forward, signs of new life everywhere. And, uh, just praise God for the life that's ours in Christ Jesus, that through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, we have life, life abundant now and into eternity one day. A um, few announcements before we begin. We have a um, governing board meeting tomorrow night. For those of you that are board members, you'll receive a link uh, via Zoom for that. And we have a, a Bible study on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. That's by Zoom as well. If you'd like to be a part of that Bible study, uh, send me an email or a call. We'll send a link out to you. We're currently in the, the book of Revelation. Um, the altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in loving memory of our mom, Alice Henry. Love from your family. We miss you. And I certainly miss uh, Alice and Linwood. A wonderful couple. Uh, the bulletin is presented to the glory of God in honor of our dad, Steve Brendel's birthday on April 30th. Love, Jacob, Mackenzie, Kaylin, and Ethan. And our usher for today is Glenn Worley. Greeters are Doug and Marcia Sewell. Uh, there is a list in there for uh, pantry needs. And um, rally day envelopes, like I say, we're not having rally day, but we still want to meet those obligations if we can. So if you're able to give towards that, you have a, an envelope that came in with your regular envelopes that you could uh, give to us. That helps the School of Theology, the missions that we serve, and also for the uh, roof project on the new building. Uh, make sure you take your copy of your newsletter with you today. And uh, there's information in your bulletin on Vacation Bible School. Uh, it's going to be at Moton Park on June 28th through July 1st from 6 in the evening till 7.30 each night. That's Monday through Thursday. Uh, we're going to need people that can help to hand out the snacks and uh, be a part of the uh, the, the crafts uh, and uh, the lessons. And uh, if you're able to help in any way, uh, you can contact Sue, uh, Sue Race. Her phone number is on the bottom of that insert. Um, we are inviting this as a family theme, as an opportunity to uh, share the good news and the grace and love of Jesus with families in our community, uh, many that are unchurched. And uh, we're, we're praying that we can have uh, enough people to uh, participate, that we can uh, minister to uh, families in uh, our community this year. So if you're able to help in any way, even if it's just one day, uh, I know that uh, Sue and uh, we would certainly appreciate that. So be in prayer about that if you could. And with that, uh, we have our uh, prayer of confession and call to worship. Please follow along with the prayer of confession in your bulletin. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin, that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. And our call to worship today is the Apostles' Creed. It's on an insert in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, that he descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy General Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, come together today to worship, to praise you, to uh, have your Holy Spirit touch our lives as only you can. We pray that you would surround us in your care, that all that we do may be pleasing in your sight. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our opening hymn today is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Sing praise to God who reigns above, the God of all creation, the God of power, the God of love, the God of our salvation. With healing balm, my soul he fills, and every faithless murmur stills to God all praise. 
blessing, an ever-present help and sting, our peace and joy and blessing. As with a mother's tender hand, he leads his own, his chosen band, to God all praise and glory. Thus all my toilsome way along I sing aloud His praises That all may hear the grateful song My bosom wearied praises Be joyful in the Lord my heart The soul and body is Lord and Christ alone, to God all praise and glory. Amen. You may be seated. We um, appreciate everyone's time and talent and treasure to allow us to uh, continue to reach and teach and grow others in Jesus as their Savior and Lord, to, to love God and to, to live a life that reflects and radiates the love of Jesus. Let us pray. Father God, I, I pray your blessing upon these tithes and offerings. We pray, Father, that you would bless this church, that we could be a lighthouse of hope for this community and a sanctuary of growth for all who enter in. Bless the gift and the giver as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus in a world that's lost in sin to a people in desperate need of a Savior. It's in our Savior's precious name that we pray. Amen. may be seated. Our uh, praise hymn today is God of grace and God of glory. Scorn thy cry, 
Amen. We have a, a prayer list that we provide for you every, every week as a starting point as you have time in prayer and your devotion, something you can keep in your Bible and, and pray for the needs uh, of uh, God's people here at Zion. Uh, receive word that uh, Nancy Geis is making great progress at Reading Rehab, and so we, we praise God for that. And uh, we just thank God that he, he does indeed meet all of our needs wonderfully each and every day in Christ Jesus. I know uh, Reverend Baum has had some, uh, some work done with his ear and uh, at a root canal. And uh, we, we know that uh, these bodies, little by little, are, are challenging us, aren't they? <laughs> and so, but you know what? I, I know that no matter what, God is good and he's promised us a, a glorified body one day, one that is no longer prone to all of these things that we are challenged with in this current life. Uh, we had a, a, a memorial service here yesterday for Anthony Trait, and uh, we want to keep this family in prayer as they mourn the, the passing of a loved one, a husband, a father, a friend. And uh, we've all experienced loss, and yet we know that through Christ Jesus, uh, the death is not the end, but simply a new beginning in the hands of a merciful, benevolent God that loves us. Let us pray. Father God, we uh, come together today. We pray for those upon our prayer list and those that you have uh, laid upon our hearts and our minds. We pray for uh, Dr. Ragsdale and Reverend Baum. We uh, pray for Nancy and uh, for Shirley Potts and Edith Stauffer and those that need your hand of healing, Marty Redkay and so many others, Lord. We, we know that you're a good and gracious God. Uh, we uh, we just pray, Lord, that you will uh, continue to bring uh, healing and hope into our lives. We pray, Father, for those that are in hospital and nursing care, that you would surround them in your care as only you can. We uh, think of, of Ken Reed and Evelyn Reed and uh, Stosh Redkay and uh, uh, Bobby Paul. We, uh, we know, Lord, that you're, you're with them every step of the way. And our, our shut-ins, uh, Scott Hewitt and Miriam Kern and Joyce Organtini, that you would be with them. Be with our missionaries and the missions that we support throughout the world. And our military men and women, Lord, be with them. We uh, pray, Father, for a national conference that's coming up in a few weeks. We pray that you would be with Bishop Bruce Hill as he leads the delegates as we uh, elect a new bishop. We pray that you would be with them, Father. Uh, and that you would uh, just uh, guide us and grant us wisdom. We, we thank you as an opportunity to meet, to see how you are working within our denomination throughout the world, and we, we thank you, Father, for, for all that serve. We, uh, we thank you for the laity and the pastors and each person, our district field directors. We, we just give you thanks, Father, for all that is ours in Christ. We pray that you would indeed give us clean hands and pure hearts as we seek to serve you by faith. We lift up the needy, the helpless, the hurting, the lost, and those that mourn that they may find healing and wholeness in your presence. And we pray as Jesus taught the disciples to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you today. I uh, spent part of my week in bed this week. Uh, on Monday, my back was hurting me. On Tuesday, the pain became unbearable. And so uh, Wednesday and Thursday and part of Friday, I just kind of spent in bed taking medicine. Uh, doing a lot better today. Uh, I have no idea what I did. Uh, it's just another reminder that these bodies are wearing out. And uh, I, I'm so looking forward to that, that the glorified body one day that's no longer prone to all of these things. But God is good. And so uh, I appreciate uh, only a handful of people knew about it, but appreciate the prayers and so forth as we uh, keep pushing forward. Um, Phyllis has restricted me. I want to get back to the gym. I, I don't know if that's going to be a reality tomorrow or not, but <laughs> pray for me. Um, we have been in uh, Acts chapter 3, and we, we looked at that last week, and we're going to give a little more background about Acts chapter 3 before we uh, move into um, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12 today. And uh, the message uh, centers on boldness in a world of unbelief. And, you know, those uh, first apostles were really bold in their faith, uh, in uh, the opposition that they faced, even to the point of death for, for most of them, with the exception of the Apostle John. And we also face persecution in the world that we live. We need to be bold about our faith as we share the good news of Jesus with a world that's lost in sin to, to people that desperately need a Savior, even if they don't realize that they need the Savior. It's our, our opportunity to share that good news of grace. Amen. Could I have somebody offer a prayer for the message today, please? Amen. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. We, uh, last week, we, in chapter 3, we know that uh, Peter and John were heading to the temple uh, for the evening prayer time. We know that in Judaism, their day started at 6 a.m. in the morning, ended at 6 p.m. And it was tradition that they prayed three times a day, at 9, at noon, and then evening prayer was 3 p.m. And we know that they were on their way to the temple to pray. Uh, they were still steeped in Judaism, even though now they are followers of Christ Jesus, the risen Lord. Uh, it would take some time before that would break away. But, you know, the truth is prayer is powerful and effective in the hands of the righteous. And, and so prayer is important. And uh, some tend to weigh prayer, that somehow prayer is more important in the sanctuary than it is in, in our homes or on the street or wherever we are. And the bottom line is Prayer is important, and we know that God hears and answers prayer. You know, sometimes people will come to me and they'll ask me to pray for them, and, and somehow thinking that maybe my prayer holds a little more weight than theirs. And the reality is, is God hears us all. We all have equal access to God. So they're on their way to the temple to pray for the evening prayer, and they come to this uh, lame beggar uh, that's asking for alms. Uh, he has been uh, not able to walk uh, since birth. And uh, Paul catches his, or, uh, Peter catches his eye, 
And uh, Peter calls out to him, and he, he's there with his hand thinking that maybe he's going to get something. And Peter says, gold and silver I don't have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, stand up and walk. And he stood up and he walked and he leaped for joy and he praised God. And the, the crowd around them, they were amazed that this man that they had seen for 40 years at the entrance gate to the temple was now up and walking. And instantaneously, the bones in his ankle and his feet were healed and strength to his legs and he was able to, to walk around and to praise God. And they wanted to know how this man was healed. And, and Peter says, it's not us. There's nothing special about me. It is by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, that this man is healed. The same Jesus that you crucified, the same Jesus that you put to death, the author of life, the perfecter of life, you crucified him. You know, you need to repent of your sins. You need to turn to God. And what he is really saying is, it's not just enough to change your mind that you have done something wrong that has harmed the heart of God, but you need to change direction. You need to move away from that, and you need to receive all that is yours in Christ Jesus. And so we know that he is speaking predominantly to the Jewish people, and, and he's calling them out. This is really bold uh, to be calling the people out uh, for their sin, and yet, uh, you know, Peter never looked back. When he was restored on that beach, and Jesus came to him and said, do, do you love me? And he repeats this three times over this bread and fish breakfast, and, and Peter was sold out completely for the Lord. His boldness for the cause of Christ in, in the world far exceeded any fear that he had of what might happen to him for his faith. And so that's where we're at today as we uh, begin our reading in Acts 4, uh, like I say, the first 12 verses. And this is Peter and John before the council. It says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. And these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. And that was just the men. We know that women and children believed and so we look, this is very shortly after the birth of the church at Pentecost where over 3,000 people were saved. We see people that are seeing this miracle of God and they're believing and they're receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. And it's an amazing thing. And in the midst of all of this come the captain of the temple guard and some Sadducees and some of the priests and they arrest uh, Peter and John, they, they throw them in the cooler overnight to deal with them in the morning because at you know, 6 o'clock their day ends. And uh, here's the thing about the Sadducees. The Sadducees, um, they don't believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. They, they don't, just don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. Uh, they don't believe anything that is said in oral tradition. They, they specifically rely only on the first five books, the Torah or the Pentateuch, whichever way you're familiar, and only the written law is what they believe in. They can believe in only what they can see and understand. Uh, they really are liberal in their faith, and uh, this fact that, that these ordinary men are, are preaching the truth, the good news of Jesus, is a threat to them, and so they have them arrested, and uh, they'll, they'll be charged, and they'll have to present themselves. We know that the religious leaders, they resented the apostles, that they were, in fact, teaching people. Uh, if Jesus had indeed resurrected from the dead, then what does that mean for the Sadducees who denied the resurrection? It means that they're discredited. It really does. And, and the reality is they cannot argue that this man that they saw by the gate for 40 years begging for alms, is standing right there with them, with Peter and John. You can't deny that something miraculous has happened because you know that over this time you've seen this man 
who, who relied on people to get them to the gate. And you know, even more so, for 40 years, they walked by this man and they were not able to heal him. It's only through the powerful name of Jesus, uh, the Nazarene, that this man was healed. And, and, and to them, you know, this is certainly uh, beyond what they can understand, and yet the proof is right there. And they don't like it. The, the bottom line, the, the Sadducees, who actually very few of them, they came to an end uh, between 67 and 70 AD, uh, and we hear no more about them in the... Uh, uh, the annuals after that. Uh, now we know that the, it says beginning in verse 5, that the next day the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. That's the Sanhedrin. It's uh, 71 members uh, that would be in a semicircle, and the, the chief priest would be the, the one that would oversee this delegation of these 71 members. And uh, they would be faced in the middle of this Sanhedrin, those were the law keepers of the day, and they, the charges would be brought before them. We know that Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, which we don't hear anything else about this John or Alexander anywhere else, and other relatives of the high priest. And so they brought in the two disciples and they demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? It's a great opportunity for... Uh, Peter to share uh, the work of Jesus, even the powerful name of Jesus. And you know, this must have resonated in, in Peter's mind. This is the same place where Jesus was brought before he was handed over to Pilate to be crucified. And uh, Peter was on the outside watching in, you know, when these charges were coming against Jesus and where he denied Jesus, even knowing him three times. And so now here Peter is in this same spot He's got to be thinking to himself, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to John? And uh, we know from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, verses 17 to 20, this is what Jesus says. He says, beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. And uh, this is a, an affirmation. You know, when you come to Jesus as Savior and Lord and you've received salvation, it is something that is completed now, but it's also something that's being worked out unto our glorified body one day where we're, we're completed and perfected in Christ, but it's done. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is an ongoing thing, and we know that the Holy Spirit is giving these apostles what they need when they need it on what they're to say, that God will speak in them and through them, that his words will be heard. And, and so it's really a, a gift of the Holy Spirit that is falling upon them. And it says in verse 8, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, not that he hasn't had the Holy Spirit before, but a, a renewing of the Holy Spirit. And he said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Are you mad at us because we've done something good? Do you want to know how he was healed? Well, let me clearly state to all of you, and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man that you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And so Jesus truly is the cornerstone of our faith. He is the one that holds our faith together. And without his shed blood, we are lost and without hope. We're having some technical difficulties here. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, the sound lady says it's not her. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm going to go ahead and, and move to this microphone. Can you turn the, the pulpit mic up? Can you hear me? All right, good. We'll continue on. Give me a little more volume on the, the pulpit mic if you can. 
already. So Jesus is the cornerstone of the faith. He is the very reason that we're together today and we're proclaiming this good news of Jesus to a world that's lost in sin, to a people in desperate need of a savior. And this is the same Messiah that was recorded in the Old Testaments of one that they should have been familiar with but they're not familiar or recognizing Jesus as Savior and Lord because he interferes with the way they do things. You see, real, real, realistically, everything they do is self-serving. Uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what they do is, is to, uh, to be show for people and to line their pockets. And, you know, it's interesting, I forget who it was, one of the, the church fathers that visited the, the, the Vatican and uh, they were being shown all of the silver and gold in the coffers of the, the Vatican. And, uh, and his response was, well, yeah, you know, where Peter didn't have silver or gold, but what he had, you don't have. And he was able to say, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And so we, we know that, that Jesus truly is the cornerstone of the faith. It says in Psalm 118, 22 and 23, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it was wonderful to see. In the prophet Isaiah in 28 and 16, it says, Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes never need be shaken. And the reality is, if Jesus is the cornerstone of your life, you have everything you need for life and life abundant now and into eternity one day. And uh, this passage closes with this. It says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And see, this is the ultimate truth that Jesus is the, the way and the truth and the life. As a matter of fact, in John 14, 6, that's what Jesus says. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, I've talked to people over the years, and more recently, more than ever, and people will tell me, well, you know, Pastor, there's many ways to heaven. There's many roads that lead to heaven. You know, you Christians think that you have the cornerstone on this, and, and the reality is, yes, we do. And I'm not telling you something that I feel or something that I personally believe, but I'm telling you something that is written in the Word of God and I believe is without error, that Jesus is the only way. That all roads may lead to Jesus, but He is the way, the truth, and life. And without Jesus, you are lost and without hope. It's not a popular message today. Uh, we really need to be bold in our faith to share the good news of Jesus. Now, we're not being persecuted as uh, people were in the past, uh, as the apostles were, but in parts of the world today, people are being put to death and put in prison for their faith in Jesus. And, and you know, the reality is if people want to argue with me and say, well, you know, there's other ways, and I just simply say, well, you know, this is what God says. You know, this is the truth of God. And, and, and I further believe that if there was another way, if there was possibly another way to heaven, then our Savior could have stayed in the throne room of heaven. He could have avoided dying a cruel death on the cross at Calvary. He didn't need to go through all of that agony. He is the only way. You know, God is love. God is good. And yes, there are, are, are things that can be beneficial, but the reality is, unless you have Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you're lost and you have no hope. It's not a popular message today, friends, but I assure you it was no popular, not popular in Peter's day. And Peter is standing in the same court where Jesus was condemned to die. And he boldly proclaims the truth. This Jesus is the cornerstone of the faith, the Jesus that you persecuted, the Jesus that you crucified, the Jesus that you put to death. And he didn't care. He didn't care what they thought. He cared more about what God thought. And I think sometimes we need to consider that when we worry about what people are going to say to us when we want to share Jesus with them. Maybe we should be more concerned about what God thinks than what they think about us. 
You know, we, we're afraid of being rejected. We're, we're afraid of, of people, you know, looking down on us. But the reality is the same as Paul says in Romans 10 and 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is true. It's true today. It was true then. It's going to be true until our Savior returns one day to put all the enemies of God under his feet. And while this message is not popular, it's life. It's the very life that our communities need. It's the very reason that we open our doors to share the good news of Jesus. We, we are here to proclaim that Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith and he is the one that we build our foundation on because without him, we're lost and we're without hope. I'll close with this today. You know, we're called to share the good news of Christ Jesus to a world that's lost in sin. I say it all the time. And so what is it? You know, the question is, it matters who Jesus is. And so who do you say that Jesus is? You know, there are a lot of people that say, well, Jesus was, you know, a good man, but he wasn't God. I mean, the Jehovah's, the Mormons, the Scientologists, a bunch of others will tell you, no, he was not God in the flesh. God can't die. But the reality is this was God in the flesh, fully human, fully divine. He died on the cross of Calvary, and God the Father raised him to new life three days later, and whoever calls on his name is saved. It's that simple. We want to complicate it. So, you know, we're called to share this good news of Christ Jesus to a dark, sinful world, and we often are fearful about sharing our faith. We, we, we don't want people to look down on us or to talk bad about us, but here's the thing. You know, what is it that discourages you from witnessing? During China's Boxer Rebellion of 1900, insurgents captured a mission station. They blocked all the gates but one, and in front of that gate, they placed a cross flat on the ground. Then the word was passed to those inside that any who trampled the cross underfoot would be permitted their freedom and life by uh, any refusing, but any who refused would be shot. So if they would you know, trample on the cross, they would be spared. But if they refused, they would face the firing squad. They would be put to death. And... Uh, you know, terribly frightened, the first seven people came out of this mission house and they trampled on the cross. And uh, the eighth student was a young girl and she refused to commit this sacrilegious act. And uh, kneeling beside the cross in prayer, in prayer for strength, she arose and she moved carefully around the cross and she went out to face the firing squad. And strengthened by her example, every one of the remaining 92 students followed her to the firing squad. So what do we risk in sharing our faith today? Surely we're not to this point yet, but what if we are? If Jesus is truly the cornerstone of our faith, are we willing to face this earthly persecution because we know the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? And he's the only way to God the Father. And we are called to share the good news of a Savior that overcame death, defeated death and sin on our behalf, that we could have life and life abundant. So what do I risk in witnessing? You know, maybe rejection or persecution from someone. Whatever the risk may be, I must realize that nothing done for Christ is ever wasted. I, I just firmly believe, friends, that now is the greatest time perhaps ever to, to share the good news of Jesus. We have a world that desperately needs it. If so, there's some watching us today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, today is the day. Invite him into your life. Call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. Saved from your sins. Acknowledge that you have sinned and harmed the heart of a holy God that was willing to, to demonstrate his amazing love by allowing his perfect sinless son to be the sacrifice that would bring us life and life abundant. This is the reality of why we are here. And, uh, you know, as the church is changing its message little by little, uh, I'm glad that I belong to a denomination that still stands firm on the word of God. 
and we're not going to back away from it regardless of what happens in our culture because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is the only way. And we praise God for his son, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we, uh, we ask that you would surround us in your care as only you can. That you would give us a boldness for Christ Jesus in a sinful, dark world. That we could share our faith with others and be proud of our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior who sets us free from sin and death, who makes us a new creation. Oh, Father, bless this little church here on the top of the hill at Zion Evangelical Congregational and our sister churches throughout the world and the, the church universal. Give us a boldness for Jesus in a, in a dark, sinful world that we can share our faith and that we can, in the process, know that you are continuing to reach men and women, boys and girls, with Jesus as Savior and Lord. Oh, Father, mold us and shape us into the people that you long for us to be. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our uh, closing hymn today is uh, Take the Name of Jesus with You. Bless you. Please stand and join me. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then wherever you go. Precious name. Sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you go. name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. blessing to worship with you today. Now next week we're going to jump forward in Acts to Acts chapter 8. So if you want to read between 4 and 8 today that would or this week that would be great and uh, we'll have a little bit of background on that as well. Uh, but I, I enjoy the journey as we unfold the word of God and divinely and, and uh, reading it and dividing it rightly and sharing the good news that is ours in Christ. Hear the good news. Christ has been raised from the dead. Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. Christ has died for us. Christ has raised again from the dead for us. Live as people of Christ. Spread this good news of Christ's resurrection to all. 
Live each day as though you are saved. Through the love of God, our Creator, the mercy of Christ, our Redeemer, and the great joy of the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen and Amen.